Listening Point is a bare, glaciated spit of rock in the Quetico Superior country. Each time I have gone there, I have found something new, which has opened up great realms of thought and interest. For me, it has been a point of discovery and, like all such places of departure, has assumed meaning far beyond the ordinary. From it, I have seen the immensity of space and glimpsed at times the grandeur of creation. There I have sensed the span of uncounted centuries and looked down the path all life has come. I have explored on this rocky bit of shore the great concept that nothing stands alone, and everything, no matter how small, is part of a greater whole. I believe that what I have known there is one of the oldest satisfactions of man, that when he gazed upon the earth and sky with wonder, when he sensed the first vague glimmerings of meaning in the universe, the world of knowledge and spirit was opened to him. While we are born with curiosity and wonder and our early years full of the adventure they bring, I know such inherent joys are often lost. I also know that, being deep within us, their latent glow can be fanned to flame again by awareness and an open mind. Listening Point is dedicated to recapturing this almost forgotten sense of wonder and learning from rocks and trees and all the life that is found there, truths that can encompass all. Through a vein of rose quartz at its tip can be read the geological history of the planet. From an old pine stump, the ecological succession of the plant kingdom. From an Indian legend, the story of the dreams of all mankind. For a long time I had looked for such a place, explored the country within reach of home for some spot that held what I wanted, and I wanted many things. There should be sunsets and moonrises and northern lights, a little beach and water that was crystal clear, glaciated rocks, a level spot for a tent and a place for a cabin too. Above all, there should be vistas into wide open space, loons with the dusk full of their calling, seagulls screaming in the mornings and the long, lazy sweep of them as they come in to feed. Such things were important to the purpose I had in mind, for through their magic I would be more aware and alive and sense what I had known on many exploring expeditions of the past. One day, after a long search, I found my point. I had come through woods and swamps off the end of a road and was suddenly out of the brush and trees on an open shelf of rock. There it was as I had dreamed, a composite picture of all the places in the north that I had known and loved. I stood there for a long time then walked over the gray ledges to the end of the point. Its tip faced the west, and across a mile of open water were clusters of rocky, pine-clad islands with narrow channels between them. Then I saw the campsite, a flat patch of beriberi on a shelf above the water's edge, high enough to be safe from the waves a place I would have chosen with joy on any canoe trip I had ever been on. Here I could roll up in my sleeping bag and feel I was still far in the bush. The crest of the point was smooth, but fringing it all around were the pines, the gnarled wind-swept ones, the twisted weather-beaten specimens for whom life had been hard 
some of them a century of age and still no bigger than a post. Back of the crest was a game trail leading through a colonnade of tall trees toward the ridges in the east. I discovered there was not only one glaciated spit of rock, but several. They lay like an open hand, with the widespread thumb holding a crescent bay between it and the palm. The fingers were half closed, the middle one facing the sunsets, the index the moonrises, the little finger the wild free expanses of the North Channel. I followed the deer trail through the pines and down to the bay. There was just a chance that the southwest winds of thousands of years might have had their effect on the rocks of that little cove. It was screened by a fringe of alder and willow, but when I stepped onto a flat rock beyond them, there was a tiny strip of white sand, sloping gradually into the deep, and the water so clear I could see the ripple marks far out from shore. Sheltered from the cold northwest gales, the little bay would always be warm and swimming a joy. The end of the thumb was a bold rocky ledge with a pine tree standing there alone. I started over there and halfway found a stand of Norway pines and clusters of white birch scattered among huge craggy rocks. From the top of one of them I could see the beach and the point itself and the vistas across to the islands and knew the search was over. Here was everything I had ever hoped to find. I would never own the water or the horizons, but the sunsets, the moonrises, and the vistas would belong as much to me as though written into the deed itself. I felt rich that day with my good fortune. Though it might soon be mine, I realized that even so, I would be a tenant, leasing the enjoyment of this bit of the Earth's crust for a few short years. The point had seen the Indians and voyageurs, the prospectors and loggers, had been a stopping place for countless travelers long before I found it. They had seen its storms and northern lights and had watched its vistas before I came. From this one place, I would explore the entire North and all of life, including my own. I could look to the stars and feel that here was a focal point of great celestial triangles, a point as important as anyone on the planet. For me, it would be a listening post from which I might even hear the music of the spheres. Wilderness sounds would be here, bird songs in the mornings and at dusk. The aspen leaves would whisper and the pines as well. And in the sound of water and wind, I would hear all that is worth listening for. I would come in all seasons, when the first buds of spring were painting the hillsides, when the sounds of summer made it seem as though the woods were pulsating with life. I would be here in the autumns, watching the pageantry of color. In the winter, when the lake was frozen and still and the point deep with snow. I would come to listen and feel and to recapture for a little while the old joys I had known. I must leave it as beautiful as I found it. Nothing must ever happen there that might detract in the slightest from what it now had. I would enjoy it and discover all that was to be found there and learn as time went on that here perhaps was all I might ever hope to know. As I sat there on the rock, I realized that, in spite of the closeness of civilization and the changes that hemmed it in, this remnant of the old wilderness would speak to me of silence and solitude. 
of belonging and wonder and beauty. Though the point was only a small part of the vastness reaching far to the Arctic, from it I could survey the whole. While it would be mine for only a short time, this glaciated shore with its twisted trees and caribou moss would grow into my life and into the lives of all who shared it with me. I named this place Listening Point because only when one comes to listen, only when one is aware and still, can things be seen and heard. Everyone has a listening point somewhere. It does not have to be in the north or close to the wilderness, but some place of quiet where the universe can be contemplated with awe.